So let's just get started. Uh, and uh, if anyone needs to drop at some point, uh, I will upload this uh, in our YouTube channel afterwards. So no worries, but there will be uh, some Q&A. So I mean, if you have questions, wait up. So, uh, so my name is Serhat Can. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders and CEO of Resmo. Um, so what we are doing, I mean, very shortly. So we are um, tracking all your resources across your cloud and SaaS tools and every change. And uh, we make sure, you know, every asset you have is secure and compliant. So that's, you know, at a glance what we do. Obviously, there are a lot of details. Um, uh, so I, um, I went to add... Uh, and he's the best person I know. I mean, about this, you know, SOC 2 compliance stuff. So, uh, I mean, I also had some questions. So, I mean, I figured why not do a webinar and, uh, you know, get answers to some of my questions, some of our, you know, attendees' questions. So, here we are. Thanks a lot uh, for, you know, uh, joining us, Dad. So, my pleasure. And I'm, I'm Ed Gardner, and I'm principal consultant at New England Safety Partners. We're a uh, North American-based uh, security consulting firm that specializes in getting people ready for things like SOC 2, uh, all the alphabet soups, PCI, NIST, ISO 27000s, um, any of those compliance exercises that your large customers are sometimes asking you to complete before they do business with you. That's what we do is we help folks get ready for it. And we've been around, uh, this is our eighth year of full-time operation. Awesome. And and at, I mean, uh, New England Safety Partners is a great firm. They're also our partner. I mean, if you, afterwards, if you have any questions about SOC2, uh, I mean, feel free to reach out to them. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I will send an email afterwards uh, to all the attendees so I can add your contact details um, to that email. Uh, so if anyone wants to reach out. Um, so uh, let me share the outline today. So first, we are going to talk about, I mean, probably you know what SOC2 is. So I, I mean, we will not spend a lot of time uh, on it, but we will start with, uh, I mean, as a startup, when you sh should start your uh, SOC2 journey. That's, I mean, that's important because it literally affects everything. Every, I mean, uh, it's, it's a lot of um, effort and uh, obviously money. So it's important to know when to start. And uh, what are the upsides and downsides if you start early or late? So, uh, I mean, I want to uh, touch on that uh, a bit because that also will help you decide um, when is the right time. And the other one is, I mean, there, this question, if you know about SOC2, there is this type 2 and type 1 stuff. And uh, usually people are not sure about which one to start with. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Uh, so we will try to answer this question. And the other one is... So we will uh, talk about the trust services principles. So, I mean, when you start the journey, I mean, there is this concept, so you have no idea, and I mean, you want to do all, maybe you want to do a few, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages again? So then we will uh, talk about the cost of SOC2, uh, getting SOC2 uh, report, and then we will um, finalize with the, um, the steps, I mean, the process. You know how, how what 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 is the timeline? What are I mean the common challenges? Obviously, we don't we will probably not have enough time to deep dive into these uh, topics, but uh, we will uh, try to I mean at least briefly touch on the uh, common you know uh, challenges and the timeline of SOC two. So Ed, um, the first question. Um, so for us, I mean, so I, I want to talk a little bit about our our uh, I mean journey. So uh, so the reason we founded Resmo, it was because after Atlassian acquired Obsini, the company we were working for, we had to comply with a lot of, you know, compliance standards that Atlassian has. And we had all these assets. I mean, it was scattered around, I mean, different AWS accounts, uh, GitHub, Bitbucket. I mean, it's, it's, it was uh, it was really hard to obtain. I mean, they were asking us questions and we were trying to, uh, you know, collect all these evidence, evidences and take manual screenshots and upload them somewhere. It was taking a, a ton of time and effort. And we decided, I mean, uh, we wanted to, uh, you know, do our own startup and we decided why not, you know, uh, build something that would help our, you know, uh, that would help us solve these problems faster. So that's how we started. And when we started, because we are a security firm, uh, the, the minute we started, companies started asking SOC2. So uh, it came up even in the early days. I mean, even when we just started, uh, this came up a lot. 
So uh, we, that's why, I mean, that's one of the reasons we started our stock too very early, but there are also advantages and disadvantages we experienced, but I want to hear from you. I mean, you work with a lot of small, medium size and, you know, some big enterprises. So, I mean, what, especially on the startup world, what is your experience? I mean, when should a customer, when should a startup start their SOC2 journey? Uh, as soon as a customer asks for it. Um, the, the, that said, there's, uh, you know, it's it's about the organization's controls. Um, I believe organization is the O in SOC2 and controls is the C. And it's either systems or service. I can never remember which one the S stands for, but it, it describes how you're maintaining your uh, enterprise from a security perspective, uh, usually at least, uh, as well as perhaps an availability perspective, so uptime, and then there's some other trust principles we can talk about in a minute. But it, it's a an attestation from a CPA that is describing your controls on how you behave as a you know a, a good corporate citizen in the in the world of security. Right. And the reason folks ask for it from those large uh, enterprises, usually from the large enterprises, um, is a couple. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. One, it's just in their checklist of do they have a SOC 2? <laughs> uh, so you'll run into a vendor manager that has no creativity and says, I need you to have a SOC 2. Um, and then people got to figure out what that means. Uh, but it, it is an independent evaluation of how you do things. Right. So a lot of the controls that are evaluated as part of a SOC 2 are around securing information, right? Do you have segregation of duties? Do you have control over your system life cycle? Do you know what to do if you have an incident and how to manage that? Are you managing change inside your organization in terms of both uh, people moving between departments and getting privileged access, as well as change inside the systems, right? So you know, in the old days, we all had data centers and there were firewalls and people logged into the firewalls and they made changes to them. And if those changes weren't governed and tracked by somebody with authority to say it's OK, um, then you weren't necessarily doing things right. Right. So you want to have oversight. Right. So I can't just have a good idea and go do it. I need somebody to say that it's OK. Um, so there's a fair amount of bureaucracy and a fair amount of policy. I mean, the entirety of the SOC 2 type one is all about, do you have appropriate policies and procedures in place to govern those things, change management, software lifecycle, et cetera. Um, and it gives you a point in time of evaluation on your organization does things in this way. And you've demonstrated to the CPA that you at least have done it once or, or twice in that way so that they are quote unquote designed effectively. So as far as when to do it, the actual SOC 2, um, usually it's triggered by people going and selling to a large bank mm -hmm. uh, or a university or a healthcare system or whatnot. And it's one of the, the artifacts that vendor managers are looking for to say, are you acting, quote unquote, like a grown up? Mm -hmm. uh, as far as when to start preparing for it, sooner mm -hmm. rather than later, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's all about documentation. And then there is a bit of bureaucracy and some of it is is just bureaucracy. Much of it can be sort of crafted in a way that it's actually helping you do your job, but it's all about checks and balances and documentation. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very helpful. I mean, so um, there's this question. And uh, so I, I want to uh, try to answer this and we'll, uh, this will uh, probably um, Great, more questions. So Batuhan is asking, so how was the Obsidian's experience before the acquisition? Do you folks had so to compliance? If yes, at what stage you decided obtaining a report? So that's a good question because, so, you know, in our current company, Resmo, we started early, but in Obsidian, um, we were growing crazy. I mean, three times, I mean, a year, 300% growth or, you know, every year, literally. So it was, you know, going um, very aggressive uh, in terms of growth. Uh, and um, when, you know, after first year of growth, I mean, we started getting more bigger customers, enterprise customers, and uh, there were a lot of security questionnaires coming our way. And that was taking a lot of time and creating a lot of sales friction. Um, I think at uh, 10 million error point or something like that, after two years of, you know, hyper growth, let's say, uh, we received our uh, SOC2 report. So uh, we started, I think, a bit late, but it was also, I think, 
um, okay, because that's when, uh, as Ed said, I mean, that's when we started getting big, I mean, customers like banks or, you know, um, bigger enterprises. Um, but in the meantime, I mean, uh, if we were to, uh, if we were a security uh, or company, or if we had some critical uh, data of the customer, uh, usually what we received is just the alert. And usually those alerts didn't contain any you know, critical information like users, email, or other, you know, um, a type of data that, you know, these companies' uh, customer data, we didn't have those type of data in Obscene. So that made it easier, I mean, to overcome these, you know, uh, questionnaires because we didn't, you, mostly we didn't have very critical data. But at Obscene, we have some critical data. So that means, I mean, the, I mean, it's, it's uh, more important for the customer to, uh, you know, um, uh get a security validation somewhat so so two is a way to do it so that's why we started early but i also i mean there are a lot of early stage startup asking me if i should start, I mean, if we should, should start our so two right now uh and as ed said i mean i'm asking are you do you have uh, customers asking for it, big customers and uh so the other question that i want to ask i mean let's say you have one customer uh, maybe a big enterprise and they are asking about SOC2 report, but you are not sure if uh, they are gonna, I mean, buy your product. Uh, at this stage, I mean, how do you decide? So it depends on how much money you have, right? <laughs> uh, say this is a good point, yeah. It's, it, you know, cause it is an investment and it, it will open doors further down the path. We were talking briefly before you started the webinar proper. Uh, mm -hmm. It, uh, when you have that attestation and you have that independent organization, a CPA, tell uh, is telling the world that as far as they can tell, if you haven't lied to them, you're doing things pretty good, right? You're doing things right. It's an attestation that they've looked at your controls and they think they're they're they meet best practice. Mm -hmm. um, the how do you decide? Sometimes, and this ends up being negotiation, right? It's a you can you well if you sign, then we'll get one six months after you sign. Right. So sometimes mm -hmm. you can negotiate with the vendor manager. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. it's just not a non-starter. They won't even go past a proof of concept until you have at least signed a letter with a CPA saying you promise that you will be getting a SOC 2 of some mm -hmm. some description soon. Um, and, you know, you can play those games with their vendor managers and with their contracts. Uh, it, but it, it really is. If it's going to gate a deal, mm -hmm. then you probably ought to do it. And mm -hmm. I can tell you that it will gate deals. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a program that into your fundraising and figure out how to get the extra money that we're going to talk about at the end, which, you know, the audit mm -hmm. itself is in that twenty-five to $50,000 range, depending on, on the auditor, depending on, on, mm -hmm. on, on how big the organization, et cetera, is. And you can spend even more because even bigger auditors could charge even more money. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, program that into your fundraising if you're going to pursue enterprise customers. Mm -hmm. because they will want some level of attestation. A lot of times you'll see in the contracts, they'll say SOC 2 or equivalent, mm -hmm. and they'll say SOC 2 type 2 or equivalent, but mm -hmm. sometimes you can get away by doing a SOC 2 type 1 first and then ease into the notion of a type 2, and we'll talk about the differences, though, I, I expect here in a few minutes. Uh, you know, But it's a, it's, it's a point of negotiation. It's like, well, if you want us to do this, we need to do that, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes people ask for more money in the contract, right? Mm -hmm. You want us to be SOC 2 compliant, it's going to cost you the delta for us to do the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, those are all good, really good questions. Point. Yeah, I, I think it does. I mean, uh, so again, like if you have any other questions, folks, feel free to ask them. So the other uh, question I um, want to add uh, is, I want to ask is, so is there any advantage of starting early or late? I mean, uh, so what what is the difference? I'm pretty sure you have customers of you know uh, you know small customers, big customers, uh, early stage, maybe later stage. What what are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? So, you know, it's an attestation of your security and some other things, availability and confidentiality and whatnot. It's it's a if you start writing policies and procedures now, they're a lot easier to sell to your engineers later when you actually have an auditor showing up and asking questions about them. So in terms of 
starting the SOC 2, you start it now. Uh, start writing policies, start writing procedures. If you if you need help, engage people who know how to write policies and procedures like us to help you write those policies and procedures. Because at some point you're going to run into that wall of we need to have one in order to close the deal. And you'll be a lot better off if you've already written a lot of stuff. Because otherwise it takes a couple of months to execute on this. Mm -hmm. Our projects for small companies tend to clock in at about two to three calendar months of time. Uh, of us going back and forth with you to make sure that we document all the things that need to be documented. And then once that two or three months has is, is sort of passed, then you invite the auditors in. And then that takes a discrete amount of time. It takes a couple of weeks for them to do what they call their field work, which is all their interviews and sampling and, and reading of your documentation. And then it can take up to two months for them to issue the report because there's a very formal process associated with creating a SOC 2 report. It's not just a couple of consultants come in and write an opinion. It's a couple of their CPA auditors come in, ask a bunch of questions, write down all those answers, ask follow-up questions, write down those answers, start drafting a report, and then it has to be evaluated by other people at the CPA. Usually mm -hmm. a couple of partner level types uh, have to sort of review it and quality check it, and then they get to ask questions. So you don't just get the report at the end of the two weeks of field work. It mm -hmm. takes some time afterwards. So work backwards from when you think that deal is supposed to close, and that's when you need to start. So two to mm -hmm. three months plus up to 60 days, six months before you need it is when you need to start. Okay. I mean, at, at least. Awesome. I mean, um, there is a question I see in there. The, the, yes. The, and that is, a, I think, an important one to answer. It, it, uh, the question is, uh, the SOC 2 report is an overall opinion given by the auditors, not a pass-fail test. That's that's 100% correct. Um, and uh, I see some of our my auditor partners are on the call, so I'm going to try not to screw this up. But it is, it's an attestation. It's a, they've read your documents and they they find them to generally be appropriate. And the language in the opinion of the report itself is really, really wishy-washy. It is not a, they're past, they're good. It's a, in our opinion, if they haven't lied to us, they're doing things in an, in an appropriate way. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's, that's very important. And, and the, you know, it, it, it's not a pass-fail test, but there is a way to fail a SOC 2. A SOC 2 opinion can be a, uh, unqualified opinion, which in this case is the past. It's good. They've read all your stuff. They've looked at all your evidence and they've said, we, we don't see anything wrong with this. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Then they end their opinion there. They, we don't see anything wrong with this. Uh, or there's the qualified opinion, which is technically the fail. Whereas we read all your stuff, except for these three things that they're not doing right or they're not doing according to the documentation that they provided us, which is more or less, which is more often the case, right? Because it's, we're providing documentation to the auditors that describe what we do. They're evaluating what we do against that documentation and saying, do we do what we say we do? Mm -hmm. uh, with a filter of best practice on it. So uh, it, it is not a pass fail, but but there there, there is a, a failure condition and that's what they call a qualified opinion. And that's usually only on a type two, uh, because it's really hard to it's really hard to screw up a type one uh, because it is a point in time and you can always negotiate with the auditors and move the date a little bit and and do things right up to uh, with some with certain sort of caveats there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you started touching up on the uh, different types like type one and type two. So let's um, talk about them a bit. But before I mean, so I had this question. So um you mentioned there are different uh, auditors. I mean, so let's say, I mean, you're working with a small firm or I, I don't know, like a CPA, like for Ernst Yank, whatever. I mean, it, does it make a difference? I mean, for companies. Firm. Yeah, I mean, big firm, like, or uh, any other they, big firm. And there are a lot of big firms doing this. Uh, usually yeah, they're, they're think, all... working with large companies, like Atlassian was working a, with a big one. Uh, but startups yeah. usually uh, work with small firms. Does it make a big difference? It, name recognition is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, it needs to be a rep. You know, they want they want to recognize the name. So if it's a you know a small CPA that is like five accountants and is you know uh, works out of somebody's you know bedroom office, while they're technically uh, allowed to and can do SOC twos, um, 
you know, that's not necessarily going to, uh, it's not necessarily going to impress the customer. Uh, sometimes your board members will have a very strong opinion on who to use for the auditors. Um, sometimes there are conflicts of interest that you can't use uh, an auditor for financial audits. Or you might want to use a different auditor for, for security related stuff. Um, it, it, it really is, a, you, you get what you pay for. So usually the more money you pay, the higher quality, unless we're talking about the big five, in which case that just costs a lot of money no matter what. So mm -hmm. Ernst & Young is going to cost a lot more money than, um, than some of, the, some of the, the regionals or even national firms. Mm -hmm. um, so name recognition means something, but that name recognition is broader than, you know, have you heard about it over coffee? You know, there are there are good firms and there are less good firms. Some people put a lot of thought and care and have a lot of formal process uh, in executing a, a SOC 2 audit. And mm -hmm. those are high quality audits. And you can tell when you read them that they did the work. And some of them are rubber stamps, uh, or at least they appear to be on the outside. Uh, and you don't get a lot of challenge from the auditor while you're doing it. And, you know, it's almost a, almost a paper mill, uh, mm -hmm. to borrow a phrase. Okay. Um, so it, and I, a lot of my answers during this are going to be, it depends. And that's another one. That's another really long way to say it depends. So if all you're trying to do is check a box, there are ways to do it and you can get it done cheap and you can get it done relatively fast. And then somebody's going to call you on it at some point, especially mm -hmm. larger, larger organizations, because they're going to read the report and they're going to, they're, they're going to be able to tell from the report, sort of the quality of the audit. Okay, I mean, these are all great points because when you start, I mean, if you don't have compliance backgrounds, background, uh, I mean, you don't know the answer to this question. So these are really helpful. I mean, um, and, and so those larger, those larger firms are going to cost 50 and more thousand mm -hmm. dollars just to do a SOC 2 type one. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, you can get, you can get a quality audit for less than that mm -hmm. um, and still and still have a, you know, you know, good solid attestation mm -hmm. to what you're doing yeah uh, did you want me to talk about the type one versus type two yes that's the that's the uh question so uh, i mean uh we have talked about this before uh in, in private so um i mean you want to try it <laughs> uh yeah i mean that's that's uh, the reason we wanted to get type one first as a startup and i want to hear from you because uh, i mean you have a lot of experience with this so i want to hear I mean, your words. So uh, SOC 2, there are two types of SOC 2 audits. Uh, there's a SOC 2 type 1 and a SOC 2 type 2. Not to be confused with a SOC 1 audit or a SOC 3 audit. Sometimes vendor, uh, uh, sometimes salespeople will hear SOC 2 type 1 and say, oh, we need a SOC 1, right? So they'll contract the, the numbers together. And th that's a completely different kind of audit. Um, mm -hmm. a, a SOC 2 audit is all about systems and organizational controls. Actually, I think that's the way you define it in, in words. The, the, the systems that you're using to deliver whatever product or service you're talking about, and usually you have a scope for the SOC 2 audit. So it's not the whole company necessarily. It's just the stuff that's necessary to deliver the Resmo platform. Right. And sort of some of the, the supporting infrastructure around that. So they don't necessarily care that you have change management on Salesforce because Salesforce isn't the Resmo platform. They might care about Salesforce access peripherally, but they're not auditing your implementation of, of how you do Salesforce. Or they're not off auditing your, your general ledger or any of the other sort of internal systems. They're auditing how you approach delivery of your of your platform as you define with them because you you have to you, you craft a scope with the auditor at the start of what's in scope and then we talk about that um, you can just do a SOC 2 for one service line you can just do a SOC 2 for one product in one service line uh, and then that that's sometimes a way to sort of limit how much you're doing but uh, the the two types of SOC 2, the type one is, uh, it's a point in time. It's a, an attestation about the design of the controls that you have that govern system security, system availability, and some of the other trust principles. And I'll define those in a second. And it's a point in time. It's a, as of uh, 9 January, 2023, Resmo has appropriate controls uh, to govern systems, uh, system security and system availability uh, if they didn't lie to us, right? And that's it. 
just a point in time, what amounts to the auditors reading all your policies and procedures and then you showing examples of those happening. A type two is the same thing. It still evaluates the design of the controls, but it's also evaluating the efficacy of them, right? So over time. So a type two is, has a set audit period, um, no, usually no less than three months. Um, uh, frequently, uh, organizations start off with what they call a six month audit period. And then eventually as you mature, you, you do it for an entire year. And what that means is in addition to say a new hire process, which might say uh, HR extends a, an offer, does a background check, waits for the background check to pass, sends an email to IT, IT creates their email account, provisions their laptop, gives them access to things. And then maybe there's a checklist that gives them access, elevated permissions if they're, you know, uh, engineering resources or IT resources, et cetera. So there's a formal process that onboards employees and the auditors are looking at that formal process. And then a type one, they're going to read it and say, that looks pretty good. Show me that it's working, but you don't have to show that it's working consistently for the last six months, which is what a type two is. So they'll look at the six month audit period that you're, you're, eva you're being evaluated on and they'll say, show me every person you hired, give me a list. And they'll do things like give me a system generated list, right? So you can't just hand them a spreadsheet. You have to dump it from your uh, HR system or you know, screenshots. You have to prove that these are actually all the people you hired and you didn't, you know, knock somebody off on the, on the list. Um, and they're going to sample at random uh, some statistically significant number. And each, each auditor has their own sort of guidance on how many they're going to look at. But if you hired 100 people, they're going to probably look at about 10. Right. So in that six month period, they're going to pick at random somebody that you hired and then they're going to look and say, OK, show me the HR ticket that, that they created. Show me their completed background check. Show me that they passed their security awareness training. Show me the IT provision, their email. Show me that they got a laptop. Show me the, the manager's approval to give them access to Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they're going to do that for each of the 10. Mm -hmm. And this gets back to how do you fail? Right. And. Every time they ask for one of those, they're going to say, did they follow this checklist? Because you've given them a, a document that describes what you do. They've evaluated that document that, and said, okay, that's good best practice. And it's a good policy, right? Now we're going to see, do you do it for all 10 of those people? And if you didn't, you incur what's called an exception. And you get too many of those exceptions. And then they might ask, okay, well, these three people didn't have security awareness training. And sometimes they'll say, okay, show me another 10. Um, exceptions become problems, exceptions become qualifications if there's too many of them or it appears to be systemic, right? Mm -hmm. If HR never submits the email to IT to create mm -hmm. the ticket, that's a systemic problem and is a good way to get a qualified SOC 2, SOC 2 report, right? Mm -hmm. Too many, too many failures, too many exceptions um, create those problems. But those type two reports are evaluating all of your controls, change management, new hire, terminations, software life cycle, incident response, et cetera, over that entire period. So I like to start with a SOC 2 type one because it gets everybody used to the bureaucracy that's associated with you know, having formal controls and formal process and formal documentation associated with that process. Mm -hmm. And then take a breath and then start your type two audit period. And then six months, six months later, the auditor comes back and does their type two audit. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned take a break, like, Brett, like how long? <laughs> um, the auditors want you to start pretty much right away. You've got mm -hmm. a little wiggle room. Um, it's a look at what you just did, right? So a SOC 2 type one report is going to describe your organization and those controls. Um, and it's going to say things like you have to have code reviews for every code check-in. You have to have a manager's approval for every deployment. You have to have you know, there's a there's a lot of process that's implied that you're documenting. And you want to look at those, you want to say, can we do this and sustain that activity every time we write a line of code? Can we do this and sustain that activity every time we hire a new person? And if you can look yourselves in the mirror and say yes, mm -hmm. then you've taken the breath and you know you can do it. If it was such a painful exercise to get to the point where you're demonstrating that one thing, right? So 
uh, I'm going to use an example that isn't SOC 2, but years ago, I worked for a software company where we implemented a drug testing plan because the banks needed it. It's not legal anymore, at least not, and I don't think so in this state, and people have sort of dropped that, but it was a huge change, and mm -hmm. it was something that people could opt out of, but then they couldn't work for the work on that larger, that larger customer, and that caused a lot of churn. And that's the sort of thing where you need to look at it honestly and say, can we sustain formality of process, be it background checks or security awareness training or uh, any other of the onboarding activities or slowing down our, 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 our deploys enough for somebody to do that formal QA or the code review or just the formal approval, all right? Can we afford to slow down enough to make sure this is happening every time because you do have to slow down you have to slow down to go fast um because you're half you you have to document things so you know that's a that's an honest question you have to ask yourselves the answer should be yes because that's the only way you're going to grow and scale is to have some of this process and a lot of the process can actually help you scale right code reviews make for better code right uh, intentional yeah. deploys or at least, you know, extremely well automated deploys with lots of good automated testing and checks make for better code. It makes for a more stable product. It makes for happier customers because you're not down for five hours, uh, you know, you know, on release day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so formal process can make things better. It can make sure people are trained. You can incur fewer um, ransomware attacks if everybody's taking their security awareness training and taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. Right, or you're doing a phishing simulation, and people are 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 learning about how to avoid ending up in the newspaper. That makes for a better company because you're didn't you know you didn't self inflict a wound. So yeah. a lot of these things that you have to do for the SOC two, or that you should be doing for the SOC two, um, can be at least obliquely helpful in 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 making the company sort of more successful. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, so I mean, I definitely understand because as an early start, start early stage startup, you have a lot of different concerns, and uh, usually, I mean, companies get stuck to because it helps sales. Uh, I mean, that's that's the reason. Almost that's the reason. That's, that's, that, that's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the reason. But and then as an additional benefit, I mean, you have all these, you know. Very usually easy to implement best practices. And as you mentioned, it does come with a cost. So there is some bureaucracy. But then, I mean, you have, for example, MDM installed in every machine you have. And you wouldn't do that. I mean, you wouldn't spend that extra money in order to stay startup. And that gives you some confidence. I mean, if something happens, you have a way to block things. Um, so those type of stuff uh, definitely helps. We have confidence. I know. You know from our own experience uh we have all these you know some of these procedures in place then we have uh we we, we know that we are doing something for security that also helps us um uh, uh because now we can do things in in a more confident way and we have code reviews i mean we we uh we definitely review every change so that definitely helps us uh, you know the quality of the code as well as you said and i i really like the word i mean you have to slow down to get fast uh that's that's i think the key uh of this you know but but being able to sustain that right because mm -hmm. sometimes you know it hasn't happened in a while but sometimes organizations you know if they're sales focused or they're engineering focused um, mm -hmm. regardless of what their focus is sometimes they don't want to change and mm -hmm. that uh, that becomes a cultural problem that you have to conquer uh, and if you've got in transit you know that that you, you've got to solve those problems before you then we're going to start at the clock on the audit period and now we've intentionally accidentally failed in the first month of of the audit period which yep. is recoverable but not ideal so make sure you know it's a uh, the SOC 2 type 1 getting to that point gives everybody sort of a taste of what's to come and you need to be ready for it and also if you take a breath you might want to tune a policy or a procedure um, and make it more streamlined um, if you make too much change to policies and procedures during a SOC 2 type 2 audit period then the auditors have to do twice the work because they have to ask you about all the things that you said you did for the first three months under the old policy and now you've got a new policy and they got to ask you the same questions and make the samples under the new policy and they're basically doubling the work maybe not quite doubling but uh, depending on how you know what the change was so folks will say sometimes change hr systems in the middle of the audit period and then you can't do 
the checklist in the way you had been doing the checklist, which changes the kind of evidence that you're providing to the auditors. And while you not necessarily haven't changed the process, you've changed where the data is stored for them to evaluate and they have to ask twice. So um, you also want to have that sort of quiescent from a infrastructure enterprise sort of perspective, not from a, you know, you're allowed to make change and you're allowed to raise software. Um, but you want to have sort of that underpinnings and the, the formality of the policy and procedure sort of relatively stable for the length of the audit period. Yeah, I mean, great points all. I mean, uh, usually you don't think about these things, but definitely, I mean, um, type one, uh, I also believe that, I mean, type one is a good way uh, to get a taste of this. Um, and uh, it can take a while, I mean, uh, to get type one. And we will, I think, uh, also... I mean, take a breath after type one. Uh, and as you suggested, uh, you know, tune up some things uh, and then uh, start type two. So that's, you know, what we are doing. I mean, uh, definitely. Uh, there's probably one more reason not to just jump right into a type two. Like it, there, there's a lot of formality in what they call the engagement letter and the auditors have to follow very specific rules. And there is no wiggle room once you say, I want to do type two. It's a type two for this period to this period. You might be able to change the start date. There might be some games that you can play with the auditor to, to, to sort of make it so you don't have uh, unintentional self-inflicted wounds, as it were. But going right into a type two, if you've never done one before and the organization doesn't have all the stuff that they need in place right away, it, it, it just begs for, uh, it begs for those exceptions that we talked about. Yep. And then, I mean, you have a lot more work to do and it's a lot of work. You see the company aren't used, isn't used to it and then I mean, it's a mess. So, yeah, because once, uh, once that yeah. stuff is written into the report, that's mm -hmm. the report you give to the customer. Mm -hmm. And those self-same vendor managers that are asking you to do the SOC 2 are saying, I see that you failed these three things. What are you doing to fix it? And how are you making sure that you're not screwing that up this time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so you you also mentioned the trust services principles. And when you start so to, I know I mean you have these principles. I mean, which one do I really need to? I mean, uh, so do, it so. depends a little bit on what you do. Mm -hmm. um, security is security is the, the the primary, right? Everybody does security, uh, but then you can add one of another uh, four uh, availability, which is talking about how stable your systems are. And they ask some questions around backups and, and uh, testing of your DR plan and some of those things. Um, there's something called confidentiality, uh, which is if, you're, uh, if your folks are handling uh, end user information sort of directly, as opposed to just caretaking a system that, that other people are doing. There's a trust principle called privacy, which is different from confidentiality, which Almost nobody does because there's some different rules around, around how that needs to be implemented. For most of your SOC 2 trust principles, you get to describe within, uh, within reason and adhering to general best practice because the auditor gets to have an opinion on whether or not you're, you're actually doing something best practice. For most of this stuff that we're doing in a SOC 2 uh, type 1 or 2, you get to describe what you do. So long as it has elements of uh, you know so best practice, right? Segregation of duties, which then implies things like code reviews and, and management approvals. Um, and privacy gets a little a little weirder, um, and there's more work to do. And then the last one is uh, security, availability, confidentiality, privacy, and then something called processing integrity. Um, and processing integrity is the trust principle that sort of looks at. Are the numbers going into the system the same as the numbers going out of the system? And it's usually, well, maybe not usually anymore. It's often for folks that are dealing with financial systems. So a dollar in equals a dollar out. We've also seen processing integrity in some biotech uh, where they are might be doing a certain kind of, of research and the, you know, they're sequencing genes or something, and you know, the, the data is flowing through the system and it starts in a in a device in a centrifuge or something and it ends up in an Amazon cloud. Uh, implementation and you know is the data uh, transacting and traversing the system is it uh, intact, right? So processing integrity is is a is a, a less common one to see for your typical tech startups. Your customers are going to want security and probably availability. If your system is critical to them, they're going to want some assurance that you have your act together and can keep it online 
uh, for whatever your promised uh, uh, uptime is, right? So security have to security availability is sort of people's first you know first year, first SOC two type one. Uh, sometimes they add confidentiality between you know, based on sort of the nature of it. I've I've seen exactly one out of about fifty privacies, and I've seen a couple of processing integrities because it's all very specific. And what you do is you work with the auditor to sort of talk through what you do, and then they make their suggestions. But they're always going to say security. They're probably almost always going to say availability. Um, and then they might add confidentiality. And it adds a little bit of work, security, availability, and confidentiality. It's just a, it, they're, they're, they're not huge extra lifts to add that to the policy and procedure that you need in place in order to be successful, uh, nor are they ex that much extra work to make sure that uh, your type two is successful and that you're doing all the transactional things that you need to do to do that. There's some there's some stuff in availability to make sure you've got appropriate testing around business continuity and disaster recovery um, that you, you won't see as much of if you're not doing availability. So mm -hmm. people usually do security and availability because mm -hmm. customers usually care whether or not your system is up. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I mean, great summary. So one thing to add maybe, so we are uh, also doing the availability. Uh, I mean, obviously the security as well. Uh, so we recently became an AWS uh, partner and uh, I mean, they ask similar questions. So it helps, uh, I mean, if you have um, similar procedures, I mean, in place. Uh, so uh, you have recoverability. I mean, you have uh, backups for everything uh, on AWS. Mm -hmm. And if you have already done this uh, for SOC2 or for AWS partnership, and it goes both ways. So, uh, I mean, uh, some questions are similar, so, yeah. Yeah, and that's a, that's a thing. You're not gonna get out of any of the questionnaires, either from partners or from customers by doing a SOC2, but you can use the stuff from the SOC2 to answer the questions in the questionnaire, right? Because uh, they mm -hmm. wanna see some level of consistency. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, everybody's gonna ask basically the same questions. And you'll see the same kinds of questions when you go for an ISO certification or or, or some of the others. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, a a trajectory that one can take to get there. You know, they want to see that you have control over change in your organization, software change, people change. Uh, they want to know that you can respond to incidents. They want to know that you can keep the systems up. Um, and uh, then they want to see it documented because if it's not written down, it doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and there is a question, and I was going to ask this. I mean, could one substitute an ISO um, for a SOC 2? It depends uh, on who you're selling to. Yeah. Um, so sometimes you'll see in a, uh, and, and, and the, the audits themselves, there's a, there's they, they share some DNA. They're asking some of the same questions. An ISO audit is uh, a more prescriptive. They're asking a question and expecting a specific answer. They want you to have very specific internal audit uh, activities, some very specific uh, types of review activities, and some very specific governance. And they need to see documents presented in a very particular way. Um, uh, other than that, you know, they're asking more or less the same questions. You know, how are, you know, is stuff encrypted? Do you have segregation of duties, et cetera? So to answer the question specifically, uh, can you substitute one? Uh, you see ISO more frequently in the international space. Uh, uh, yes, maybe in Europe it's more common. Yeah, uh, but if you are selling to could, US, if, yeah, so yeah, the stock two is is the uh, the AICPA and the A stands for American. Yeah. Um, so it's a uh, it's you know it depends on who you're selling to. If the contract says SOC two or equivalent, you ask them right up front. Does my ISO count as equivalent? And they will probably say yes. Okay. Awesome. I mean, I don't have a lot of experience with this, just, you know, conversations I had with uh, friends. Uh, but as far as I, uh, I that's my feelings. Talk to is more like, I mean, it's, it's, you're going to end up, trust you're going to end up with both. You're going you're gonna to end up with both at some point, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah and, and there's a whole litany of alphabet soup that we could talk about after that. There's all sorts of things that you can do. This doesn't get any cheaper. It doesn't get any easier. It just gets, there's just more letters that you got to add after the, uh, after the company name. Yeah. And, and you said cheaper. So let, let's talk about the cost. So, I mean, you already mentioned some of, uh, you know, uh, 
these things. But I mean, if you are an early stage startup, 50 people, 10 people, I mean, it, it doesn't really make a big difference probably. But I mean, what would be the cost? I mean, if you are starting your stock to type one. Uh, and once again, I'm going to say it depends. So it depends on the auditor um, because that's one one of the costs. Um, you know, set aside upwards of fifty thousand dollars just for the audit. You probably get you get get some for less, but you know, start putting that in your brain. You know, it's anywhere between twenty five and fifty. Um, you're yep. probably going to want to help writing stuff. Right. You, mm -hmm. A lot of times that's why people hire us is they don't have time to write all this stuff down. Um, we're, you know, we're going to basically cost the same as the audit because we're going to spend three months doing work. Um, and then there's probably some less tangible costs associated with the work that you guys actually have to do in order to implement things. Because you can't have the consultants do everything uh, for two reasons. One, uh, the auditors don't like it when, all, when, when it's just me doing the talking. They want to hear from you that you're doing these things. And two, some of it's very specific to um, very specific to how you do your job, right? I can write a software lifecycle policy for you, but if it, you know, if it, you, you've got to be able to evidence that policy and, you know, it's going to depend on your tooling. Are you using Bitbucket? Are you using Git? Are you using um, the other Git? Uh, are you using something else, right? What is source control? How do code reviews get executed? You know, when do they get executed? How much is automated? How much is manual QA? How much is automated deploy? How much is CI CD? How much is just, you know, somebody making an installer, right? So the policies aren't one size fits all. So you've got to figure out how to take, you know, what, what I might write as a policy and between the two of us, we'll have a conversation on how do we make this work inside your organization and what words do we need to change in this policy or procedure in order for it to not just match what you're doing, but also be compliant. So there's some costs associated with time that you have to devote to it. And you might have to implement things, right? So incident management is a big deal in SOC 2 because they want to know that you're responding to incidents. So having ways to detect bad things happening means some monitoring. So Ops Genie or Resmo or, right, you know, so both or both, right? So have Resmo send stuff to Ops Genie and Ops Genie send stuff to my DevOps guys and my DevOps guys get up at two o'clock in the morning and go do a thing. And then it's all documented in a JIRA ticket. So there's, there's an implied tooling, but there isn't any one tool that's required. So there's probably costs associated with that. You might need to turn on features in your Amazon account. Right. You, if you don't have CloudTrail turned on, you probably you need it turned on, right? And that's going to have a cost associated with it. You might need to uh, purchase a Qualys subscription for vulnerability scanning for your Amazon account. Uh, and then there's corollaries in Google and, and Microsoft as well. So, you know, turning stuff on because Amazon likes money costs more money. So that that ends up being a cost there. So. I think one of my other customers said count on it being between 60 and a hundred thousand dollars or 60 and as much money as you have um, to sort of do all the stuff that you need to do auditor included. Yep. And, and um, if it's compliance, I mean, even if you're existing to link, they uh, want to start charging you more. So, I mean, they want to you start moving to enterprise plans and all. Uh, exactly. So again, the tooling and definitely, I mean, the, the price of the tooling increases as well. I mean, for us, for, us, for example, just to give you an example, uh, I mean, you have to enable, for example, RDS backups, or, I mean, you have to have uh, instances running in multiple regions, or, I mean, have backups in, you know, for some uh, services and again, enable uh, cloud trail and some other services and then it would uh, definitely increase your cloud costs and that's some complexity as well and in the long run I mean uh, you have some you know let's say a bit more complex infrastructure and um, obviously it pushes you for automation uh, for, so it can lead to I mean some best practices uh, on the way but it creates some friction as you start so as a startup I mean you have to think about all these costs um, so I mean the last question uh and if you have any questions, folks, I mean, we have about eight minutes, so I think we will have some time. Uh, so the last question is, I mean, so you already, again, talked about uh, this a little bit. So uh, what, I mean, you, you talked about the timeline. So let's talk about some of the biggest challenges you will face. I mean, you start your stock to compliance. What should people expect? Bureaucracy. I mean, the bureaucracy. So uh, uh, like I said, we can, we 
pretty consistently can take you know these small medium almost almost regardless of it very large customers it might be different small medium startup to startup to small you know give me three months calendar time and you know between you and i and my team and your team we'll be ready for an auditor to come in and have a question yep um so pretty consistent what is the number one challenge? I mean, you, you have all these, it, you know, companies. Uh, getting engineers to slow down. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. You got, you got, you've got the computer or, or yeah. having, or getting technical staff to give up access. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh yeah. So, uh, then so, yeah, they have to wait for access. They have to request stuff and they're not used to it. They just, I mean, directly connect they, to yeah. production. They, they just want to write code. And Write code, push deploy. Write code, push deploy. Yeah. Um, so that means that you have to have an awful lot of automated tooling and a lot of automated quality checks in order for that to even be a possibility. So you got to do a lot of work in order to make that happen. Uh, so getting them to slow down, getting um, uh, other parts of the organization, finance, HR, whatnot, to make sure they write stuff down. One of the one of the so I used to have a pat answer that the, the hardest things for to to get compliant be it PCI or SOC two or whatever is change management and who are my contractors <laughs> right so change management and then HR onboarding and offboarding right and making sure yeah. stuff happens in a timely fashion right so you know the the engineering side of it code reviews mm -hmm. QA actual QA whether it's automated or a human. Mm -hmm. And then some oversight and some review of what ended up getting deployed, mm -hmm. right? So there are, you know, so that segregation of duties is challenging because engineers just want to write code and push buttons. No offense to the engineers in the room. Um, but on the other side, it's the, you know, HR related stuff. It's like, oh yeah, Bob, Bob's leaving on Monday. And then somebody forgets to send an email there. They forget to open a ticket to say, okay, we need to terminate Bob. Bob needs to no longer be an employee. And you'll find that happening you know, with some regularity. Or on the flip side, Bob just got hired, but completely forgot to take his security awareness training. Or, oh, we forgot to finish the background check, right? So it's those details. And they are very bureaucratic uh, in, in their execution um, are the yep. things that'll trip you up. Yep. Uh, so uh, checklists so you, and mm -hmm. automatic documentation. So using things like Jira and OpsGenie and having automation and that way you're sort of documenting as you're going mm -hmm. and you're less likely to forget to write something down because yep. that that's the thing that'll kill you. If it's not written, if it's not written down, it didn't happen. <laughs> yep. Yep. I mean, that's, that's the key word, I guess, documentation, documenting things. Um, and, and I mean, I, I was, so we have some customers, I mean, just, you know, uh, they, their main use cases, for example, offboarding, I mean, usually, uh, when someone leaves the company, they, they, they want to, I mean, see what they have. I mean, all, among all these tools, uh, whether they have access to, uh, an existing tool, even though they left, whether they have their phone number, I mean, entered, I mean, uh, in, in some of the tooling they have, I mean, they don't have a good way to track these things. I mean, I was surprised, uh, to, I mean, face with this uh, use case because we didn't build Tresma for this when we started, but I was surprised, I mean. Well, and, and if we were looking at Resmo uh, ourselves, you know, over the last several months, you know, getting at the, what does this person have access to? That the notion of identity management is writ large uh, when it comes to compliance, because you do want to, I need to turn this guy off or this gal, this person needs, needs to not be in the system anymore. Where are they? And having the tooling to understand where those user identities are so that you can go in and do something about it um, is, is incredibly important. Uh, but yeah, the termination, like, did you get them all? And for a SOC 2, you've got that narrow scope of just the system and the stuff that supports it. So they might not care that they still have a login to uh, the marketing uh, widget because it's not an in-scope system, uh, but you might care. Uh, so that comes back to some of these days, these process say, hey, you know, Salesforce licenses cost us a lot of money, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So a good termination process should include making sure that Salesforce license is appropriately turned off. Yep. And, uh, and so that's where, you, uh, that's where you get people to start paying attention to you because you're starting to save them money. 
Yep, yep, uh, yeah, exactly. And so the last question. Uh, so we will have. Um, uh, so Batuhan asks: uh, Is SOC two report has a fixed price uh, from given auditor, or do quotation changes based on client's company size, revenue, infra infrastructure? It changes based on complexity, and and again, it, uh, or and the auditor, right? So then they, they'll have different rate sheets. So they'll 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 have a, a conversation with you. Um, to talk about your your environment, is it an Amazon? Is it in, you know is it a data center? God forbid. Is it uh, you know in Microsoft? You know, and they'll ask some questions around how they think you're prepared for it. Uh, many auditors will also, uh, as part of their quoting process, suggest what they call a readiness review, which is different than the work that we're doing, although it dovetails into it, uh, where they you know they look at it and they say, okay, you've got about eighty percent. We think if you fix this this twenty percent. We can come back and have a successful audit, and then they go away because they're not allowed to help you fix it, right? They're they're what they call conflicted out. They can't write the policy and then evaluate it. You have to do it. So, but they'll they'll do a readiness. They'll come in and look at it, and uh, and they'll say you're okay. So, a yeah, large company costs more money. Uh, if you've got multiple products and services, and those products and services all operate slightly differently, right? You've got five five products, and each product has its own engineering team. Each engineering team uses their own source control. This this engineering uses Zendesk. This engineering team uses Jira. You know that complexity will drive what uh, you know will drive everything, um, but not, not the least of which is the actual whatever the CPA quotes you. And I, I see at least one CPA on the call, so I'm sure he'd be happy to answer questions more directly. Yeah, uh, I mean, thanks a lot. Ed. This was uh, this was great, and now I have a document that I can send, you know, to people if they ask these questions about anything about SOC two. So uh, this was great. So uh, again, folks, I mean, if you joined us late, so I will upload this to our YouTube channel, uh, and I will send you an email uh, with ads. Um, uh email address and how you can reach out to him if you have any more questions um so uh thanks a lot for joining us today so uh, see much. you on the next webinar yeah thanks a lot thanks Bye. man Cheers.